भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया लाइव फ्रॉम सुपर सोल फार्म दिस इज विजडम ऑफ द सेजेस a daily yoga podcast with your host Raghunath and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show and welcome to Sleep in Sunday. I slept in. I slept into a late 5 o'clock today. It's it inexcusable. Good. It's Sounds inexcusable. Acceptable. But Sunday is our special guest day. First of all, before we announce our special guest, we want to welcome everybody from our Facebook community. Welcome. We do this every day, 7 days a week, hardly taking a break. but this is what we do it's what we love to do it's yoga philosophy and how to live it and how to apply it monday through friday at 5 a.m. eastern time you can join us live on a uh, zoom and you if to get those magical zoom codes you must email our executive producer mara at wisdomofthesages108 at gmail.com and then she will give you the codes and you can enter our forum otherwise we do this uh you can hear us anywhere you get podcast um So um Monday through Friday we study sacred literature how to apply it the book we're going through right now 18,000 Sanskrit verses it's called the Shrimad Bhagavatam the cream of the crop of all Vedic literatures of how to apply bhakti yoga to your life and we go through it we study it we try to apply it and live it um and it's a it's it's a it's a interesting ride how to apply this stuff and so on Saturday and Sunday we do something very special we sleep in a little we get to go we start at 8 o'clock and at 8 o'clock we answer our questions cuz questions come up naturally on this path and then on sunday so yesterday was question day and on sunday we bring in a person we think is sort of cool and today we have someone very 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 cool we bring in chaitanya charan welcome chaitanya charan from you're a mumbai boy right is that correct yeah thank you happy to be here <laughs> originally from <laughs> mumbai originally from pune Well, I am from Nasik, which is about Nasik. three Nasik. hours from both of the places. Nasik is a holy place, isn't it? Yeah, it's the holy it, place of Lord Ram. This is the place of Lord Ram. This is where. Um, what happened there? What happened in Nasik? It has to do with the nose. Am I correct? Yeah, that is the place where Ram lived while he was in exile, and then when the demoness attacked Sita, Ram's consort, so her nose was cut off. So the nose in Sanskrit is called as Nasika. Achha! That's how the name came, Nasik. Someday, in your, <laughs> we won't get into it now, but someday, in your very analytical way, you will explain how that's not a terrible thing. Okay, it's not good. <laughs> you mean it's not good to cut people's noses off? What's wrong with that? That's how we used to do it. On the lower <laughs> side. Okay, I'm going to read your official bio. Then we want to speak from our heart. Chaitanya Charan is a renowned international speaker, mentor, monk, spiritual author, and life coach. He travels all over the world, from Australia to the USA and beyond. and has given um talks at prestigious universities such as Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Cambridge and he also has given a talk to the United Nations Educational Organization as well as multinational organizations such as Microsoft, Google and Intel. Wow, I'm pretty impressed with that. <laughs> okay. An engineer by education, he is the author of 25 books. He also blogs daily on the Bhagavad Gita at gitadaily.com where he has written well over I kid you not 4000 articles. He writes one every day that are read by thousands through daily feeds worldwide. That's quite an impressive resume. I think that's just scratching the surface actually. You know what's interesting? I knew nothing about that. I just loved you because I would have lunch with him at the GEV. And he would be there sitting there and me and my wife would come and sit with him and we'd ask him questions and I thought, what a learned sweet man. I had nothing I knew nothing of your of your accolades or of your uh, uh, of, of of all your accomplishments. That's quite impressive. He also has a a yeah. YouTube channel. Is it Chaitanya Charan? Is that what it is on YouTube? Yeah, Chaitanya Charan. Yes. So then you spell C Chaitanya with a C H or C A? C H. C H. C H A I T A N Y A Charan C H A R A N. 
Chaitanya Charan. You find that Very on YouTube, nice. and there's just uh, that is like a gold mine of, um, or, or it's it's a mine of gems. Let's say there's so much information, and and this is just what I would like to share is that, you know, there are different. We're all different in different ways, and and um, we all have different types of minds, or you could say brains in a sense, the way that we look at the world and analyze the world and of of all the people that i've met in my life you know there are a few people that i really think they have just an intellect that can break things down like like it's a superior computer that they have right? and yeah i it's, think his computer is much more superior to it's, them it's like most. way better than mine yeah and it's just like it can very quickly grasp the essence of complex issues and then break them down. And this is where like, he's really got the mind of an engineer. Take, he can take philosophical concepts, social concepts, all, all different kinds of concepts and just categorize them, break them down in his own mind and then communicate them very clearly so that they're understandable. Uh, and also commonly with a lot of humor too. So he, <laughs> he, he, and, and, and it's the, the, the topics that he can speak on are so vast. That's like if you go and you, s you go to his YouTube channel or, or to his um, written articles, there's so many topics and you can throw one out there and he'll have this in-depth analysis of it, you know, breaking it down into different, it's all there. Hmm. I don't know how you do it, Prabhu, but I am, uh, I'm, I'm in awe. Well, after that introduction, whatever I speak is going to be an anticlimax now. No, I think no, no. So See, it, it, will, it will fulfill it. It will fulfill it. But, you know, on top of that, you know, you're part of a community that's so dear to Raghunath and myself and to many of our listeners. The um, Well, you live now most of, you know, I think you travel all around the world, but um, your base would be, I think, the Govardhan Eco Village now more so than yeah. the uh, the Radha Gopinath Temple in Mumbai. But they're both kind of sister projects or in a sense, one project. True. Yeah, that's true. So you're living at the Eco Village, and, and no, I, you know, I don't even think we uh, got into his books. He's a prolific author. He's got over twenty five books. There are twenty five books. Yeah. How do you have time to do this? He doesn't waste time. You see, that's what he doesn't I, that's, waste time. That's the thing. I waste time. <laughs> that's we waste time. He doesn't waste yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, this I, is the. I like. But there's this one more thing I really want to mention. This is important, and this is something that that doesn't often come up in conversations about Chaitanya Charan. But actually, when Chaitanya Charan was one years old, he contracted polio. Oh, really? and he's lived with that now for the rest of his life. So, when you walk, you walk with crutches, right? It's not not easy for you to get around. Um, but uh, but he, meanwhile, he still travels the world like nonstop, speaking you know the, the whole globe. And writing all these books and writing all these arts going to do so much. Um, it's really quite, quite something for real. Thank you for doing all that you do. Were you born? You for... a, were you born a devotee of Krishna? Well, I have not yet become a devotee, so I'm still struggling. I was born in a Brahmin family, <laughs> Brahmin family, okay. uh, which is which is pious but not religious. So I knew the stories of and the general concepts of the Bhagavad Gita, the stories of the Rama and Mahabharat. But we were more into education and uh, more of uh, westernization. That was the atmosphere in our culture, in our home. Mm -hmm. So definitely religious, but not spiritual, you could say. It almost seems like religion or spirituality took, has taken a back seat in sophisticated, well-to-do, and even pious families in India. Is that correct? Uh, yes and no. Religion in the conventional sense has definitely taken a back seat. But spirituality in the sense of you know, wanting to explore something that will offer peace of mind, that will help one to find fulfillment. So that is something which is, even in the progressive part of India, it is uh, growing. So often sure. the places like Bangalore, Pune, Mumbai, where we have a lot of software engineers, that are the places where a good number of people are also turning towards spirituality. Hmm. Yeah. So I feel it's just a matter of a different way of uh, accessing the spiritual wisdom. So more of religious rituals are not what people are attracted to. But if, if the wisdom is presented in a way that can help people make their lives more meaningful, manage mm. their emotions better, connect with each other more deeply, then definitely spirituality is in that sense, I would say rising. 
Mm-hmm. Although religion is declining. As a bunch of Westerners, mainly, we have some people from India and some people in India listening to the show, but as a bunch of Westerners, mainly, we find ourselves to be what we call dented cans, a little bit broken. We say that when you say a I came from a pious Brahmin family. Me and Kastuba, a lot of, a few of us, a handful of us know what that means. That means you grow up worshiping deities. You grow up from childhood chanting the Bhagavad Gita. You grow up from childhood hearing the pastimes of Ram Leela and Krishna Leela. You do, you know, you worship, you, you understand the Brahmins and you have a family priest, etc. cetera. Um, you're not uh, going to the prom or going to pep rallies or going to, um, you know, or, or, or dating when you're 12. It, it's from, it's hard for even American to even grasp that. So a lot of us don't have cohesive family units. We didn't grow up in that. We bro- grew up in broken families. A lot of times there's been a lot of trauma growing up in the West. We, we come off, we present very well in the West. We've got wrinkle-free lawns. Our highways are together. We have guardrails on cliffs. We present great. But that real um, family unit has been cracked. There's been a crack in the seal. And because of it, we grew up with a lot of trauma, a lot of issues. We grew up with either overbearing parents or missing parents. Um, And it's driven us to drugs, alcohol, um, illicit illicit sex, sex addiction, drug addiction, um, uh, 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 running away from home. No regard for our parents. Matter of fact, getting out of the parents, giving our parents the finger, telling, you know, running away from home. And ask your question. (laughs) So I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm I'm trying to give him what he's dealing with. I mean, what you're about to do. So we grow up with a lot of trauma. We grew up like our face ground to the dirt and now broken. We're looking towards light. What do you do in Bhakti? when you're coming from so much baggage, when you're coming in where you can't trust, where you feel a little, um, uh, uh, you, 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 where you have a lot of self-loathing, how do you deal with a mind like that where we, 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 we don't trust? Um, we, we, we're, um, yeah, there's a lot of self-hatred going on. There's a lot of voices in our mind telling us we can't do that. You'll never be as good as that. How do you bring that into a bhakti circle without making tons of offenses, right? Because sometimes it's it's very it seems very simplistic. Oh, you just chant the holy name. We're gonna have, please let him names. talk. You know, okay, I just want to make question. sure he gets this gets the understanding here. Okay. Yeah, Elf. Firstly, I would like to say that the grass always seems greener on the other side. So after I have spent some time traveling in the Western world, I would say that whichever devotees or spiritual aspirants I have met from America, from UK, from Australia, I have seen an enormous level of earnestness. Now, it is true that, say, actually, the first person who I met who uh, who was from a divorced family, was after I came to ISKCON at the age of 24, that is the first person I met. So it is, as you said, the family unit is very, was at least very stable quite a, at least two decades ago. But I would say that if, if we consider, there are two ways to look at spirituality. See, one is that how we have been living in the past. So if we put our fingers horizontal, vertically, then the way we have been living in the past some of us may be living in, as you said, uh, well-established family units with a, with a good sense of connection and responsibility. And, and some of us may not be living that way, maybe the opposite. And we could say spirituality is above that. So that, this is one way of looking at spirituality that it's a progression. But another way of looking at spirituality is it's like this. That me, it's like this means whatever as material level is, it's like horizontal. Mm. It doesn't matter. From wherever we are materially, we can access life's spiritual side. So I find that the most important thing for growing spiritually is that sense of earnestness and that sense of wanting to grow spiritually, wanting to explore spiritually. 
and that i have seen in wh whoever i have interacted with so i would say that that sense of earnestness sometimes gets lost in india because of complacency oh this is just a part of our culture we have grown up with this mm. so it's always there one of the teachers in our tradition bhakt siddhant as i would say that the people who miss the train the most are the people who stay next to the train station because they are right next to the train station nearby. i just go and catch it uh -huh. so but those who are stay far away from the train station they make it a plan you yeah, have to come here in time right take it for so granted they take it for granted maybe yeah so now having said that uh with respect to your specific question let's say that spirituality the way i usually talk about it is that there is like there is the inner world and there is the outer world and technology in which the western world has progressed enormously now technology makes things better and spirituality makes people better mm -hmm. so technology helps us to transform the outer world and by that we so in the western world that has been done enormously now spirituality helps us to better organize and improve our inner world and that is where if the two can come together then we can actually be a part of not only making our own lives better but also the world better so mm. so spirit this is so the spiritual wisdom of the eastern world it's a uh, especially if like the way you have created a congenial spiritual support community if you get a community like that we all can go beyond uh, whatever wounds we have from the past now we are all in some ways prisoner we are products of our past mm. but we are not prisoners of our past well I like so that. we're not products <laughs> of our, we are products of our past but we are not prisoners of our past mm -hmm. Tattoo, tattoo time. I'm going to tattoo that right on my back. What do you think? <laughs> Sorry about that. Continue, please. Yeah. So, so spiritual growth helps us to whatever wounds we may have from the past, we can always grow from there. So I often like to use the example of a software. Now, if we have a computer system with a hardware, software, and user. so that's like our body mind and soul the okay. body is like the hardware the mind is the software and the soul is the user mm -hmm. so you know if we consider say like google if i search something on google and you search something on google we will not get the same find same hits because google tracks what all history we have searched before and it oh. customizes the results and so No, like when you, so when you plug like a URL that. into, you know, it starts to fill it out for you, like okay. automated. All right. I'm... Okay. Yeah. So say, so our mind is also like that. So whatever we have thought of before, whatever we have dwelt on before, that becomes sure. stored and that comes back as a auto prompt. Wow. Wow. So if if say somebody has, uh, I suppose in India, many of you know the movie industry is called Bollywood. yeah so like we have hollywood so if somebody has say visited bollywood.com repeatedly uh, yeah sorry. then they come to a spiritual talk they hear about the bhagavad gita and they want to find out what is this bhagavad gita and as soon as they type b in their google the browser immediately it gives bollywood.com mm. they wanted so that... to go to a bhagavad gita but bollywood.com comes along so because that's, that's like what the has been the product pushed. of the past Yeah, that's the product of the past. Okay. So, uh, so, so, what comes up in our mind? What kind of uh, actions we are prompted toward? That will be determined by our past. But just because Bollywood. dot com has come on my browser, that doesn't mean I have to select it and go ahead. For somebody who has say selected Bhagavad Gita before, as soon as they type B, Bhagavad Gita will come and immediately they will go there. Yeah. For somebody who had typed Bollywood. dot com before. they'll have to put in more effort bs come bollywood no i don't want to go there i'll type bhagavad gita and then i can go to bhagavadgita.com mm -hmm. so you now certain promptings will come to us from our past but you no know, we always have the free will to choose now now that choosing may require a little more effort based on the kind of uh, 
choices we have made or the impressions we have got from the past but the bhagavad gita tells us that we always have free will hmm. and that free will it is something which we can either increase by choosing properly or decrease by not choosing properly but that free will is always there so and the spiritual spiritual resources provided by the gita help us to expand the ambit of our free will hmm. so that's how i whatever be the past you know the spiritual wisdom of the gita can help us create a, a bright future mm-hmm. for ourselves I, you know I, i a lot of times when i'm typing stuff on the computer that that auto suggestion is like so strong that it's making actually more difficult to just write what I want to write yeah. right because this keeps and then you actually have to make sometimes I go two or three times and I I get the same wrong word before I click right. and and choose not to uh, uh use the suggested word that they're put the suggested spelling or the suggested word especially when you're doing a lot of sanskrit stuff right because the things aren't True. programmed for that so you're saying that um our minds you said that we're a product but not a prisoner of our past yeah. and so in a sense we're a product of our past because our mind has been exposed to so much that when we hear a to- of a topic or we have a particular experience then there's an automated mental res- response that comes up yes and and then we have the ability to say no that's not what i want that's not the way i want my mind to respond what to speak of my body to respond to this i will make the conscious effort to um choose not to go with the automated response and go with the chosen response based on my own free will now that's a i i love that analogy um but let me ask you this and and raghunath he began this with his um extended talk on <laughs> oh, no. oh, no. he was talking <laughs> about he brought up clear. he <laughs> no it's great thank you but he brought up like the idea of like self loathing like these difficult emotions that we have in life um I, you know i think it's kind of rampant in our society now you know that uh negative loops that go on in the mind the different emotional experiences that you're saying that we have the opportunity like i might be exposed to a particular vision or a particular sound or a particular place or, or whatever it may be and there may be an automated response coming rising in my mind even emotionally rising in my mind and you're you're telling us we have the opportunity to choose not to accept that but it seems that that automated response can be so powerful it's like that we actually don't have any choice you know it 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 almost yeah. it, you know it it you know it it seems like i don't want to think this way and i don't want to feel this way but i i do feel like i'm not i'm not at just only a product of my past but i do feel like i'm a prisoner of my past can you speak to That's that a little true. bit i i i fully agree with that so that uh, to, i'll use two metaphors for this to explain mm-hmm. this point if you consider a sine wave sound wave goes yeah. up and down a uh, sine wave Mm-hmm. it goes up and down and up and like electricity wave yeah so when our we have times let's say if, if or let's take another example if the electricity level is here and then there's a sudden pulse in the electricity so when the pulse is there it shoots up so similarly for us you know, we we may have a particular level of say craving for some things and sometimes that craving just shoots so when the craving just rises at that time to say no seems very difficult hmm. so the best way to begin is to not worry so much what happens when the urges have surges now hmm. we all have urges and sometimes hmm. those urges have surges so instead of focusing at the times when the urges have surges we can focus on the between times mm-hmm. it's not that these urges surge constantly and if we define ourselves solely by the times when those urges surge i decided i will not do this mm-hmm. and still i ended up doing it and we will end up beating ourselves more and more so instead of focusing on those surges focus on between the surges in general that's when we now, do our work in other words that that's where we reprogram or 
that yeah. auto response that, yeah so you know there are, we can make two kinds of resolutions now new year is coming so we all will probably make some resolutions so there are negative resolutions of what i will not do and there are affirmative resolutions of what i will do mm -hmm. in some ways both are important but it's much more productive to focus on affirmative resolutions of what i will do mm -hmm. and not so much on negative resolutions of what i'll not do because in a sense ne negative resolutions actually a dead person can keep them better than us okay. <laughs> they don't do anything so they won't do anything anything undesirable also unhealthy also so when we focus on positive resolutions then that slowly starts strengthening us mm. yes i can i can decide to do something and i can do it and as we keep doing that so instead of say if somebody has some unhealthy habit i will not do this so if we spend a lot of time on social media and if i decide i'm not going to go on social media or i will not spend time watching movies on netflix or whatever so instead of that focus on okay every day uh, say i'm going to attend the wisdom of the sages podcast every day i'm going to read some wisdom text for this much time so as we start doing the positive that starts giving us strength sure. and that strength will eventually make us strong enough so that when the surges happen mm -hmm. we'll be able to resist them okay you know, uh, so un but unfortunately like you talk about self loathing runath pro earlier that yeah. self loathing usually happens when we set goals and we fail to achieve them then we start beating ourselves up hmm. so and that usually happens when we set negative resolutions this is what i will not do so instead if we set positive resolutions affirmative resolutions and start with that then slowly we also start feeling uh, feeling better about ourselves we start feeling more confident and then over a period of time so this was one metaphor i used about the surges of the urges and yeah. second is even when those urges come up you could we could compare them to like a arm wrestling match sometimes say i am saying i won't do this and the urge is pushing us do it do it do it so at that time the key thing to know is that this is this it's a arm wrestling match but it is like a, a timed arm wrestling match So okay. it's like say three minute round. If now my hand might be just on the table, but it's if three minutes gets over, the person can't push anymore. The round is over. So what so happens when the urge starts coming in. up? Yeah. At that time we start feeling okay. I can resist it now. I can resist it now. But how long? If this is how I have to keep resisting for the rest of my life, forget it. But actually, our fight against temptations is like a. timed arm wrestling match hmm. so if you keep that in mind yes this surge has happened and it seems irresistible but it is not going to be at this intensity all the time hmm. so if i can just hold on for a little time the surge will subside that must be why and then the, the surge subsides then say we can one survive one day at a time right yeah there's where you get the one day at a time yeah very true hmm. very interesting now, beautiful now, beautiful answer good stuff you know you you've now we've kind of wandered into the topic of addiction right yeah and is and addiction, is, is addiction an issue in india is it is a popular is it popular like it is popular we really got to go we ha really have it dialed in well we've here we mastered it over here yeah we're we're the addiction <laughs> masters what's it like in india with addiction oh it is becoming big you know in fact uh, to, yeah. there are some play, especially in the colleges and the younger generation uh, drugs are becoming big Hey, you Alcohol. want American culture? You want American movies? You want American lifestyle? Welcome to the downside, American addiction. That's true. In yeah. some ways, you know, Indian modern India, especially the metropolitan cities like Mumbai and Delhi, in some ways, actually, they are getting the worst of the West and the worst of India. Mm. The worst of the West means we don't we get the technology, we get all that, but we don't have all the progress corresponding with it and in these cities the spirituality is also lost because mm. it's so so urbanized so yeah. it so is a problem delhi is out of control it's like a massive urban sprawl yeah it, and it's compared pollution. to was when you grew up were you in a village or were you in a city 
I was in a town. So I was in various places in Maharashtra. Mm. And it was relatively very peaceful, very serene. So mm, it was very natural, you know, that the, we had a temple just near our home. So the main entertainment was going to the temple and uh, <laughs> doing some kind of hearing some talks. Did everybody hear the, that? Uh, Hold um, on a second. Freeze the show. The main entertainment was to go to the temple and hear some talks. That was it. That's entertainment, people. There's no Netflix. There's no um, what's it's a blockbuster show. video. There's no um, you know morning cartoons. You go to the temple. Well, the temple and, is a variety show, right? There's music. Well, yeah, I there's, know. There's discussion. It's right? a cultural. You know, there's dance sometimes and theater, and um, there's food, and there's yeah, it, it's it's a variety show. Now, Kostuba and me went to India in the '80s, uh, in 1988. So I, I think that for us, we, we, we are fortunate to visit India when there were no roads, every, you know, the, the roads stunk. But the upside of that was there were villages, there were people driving ox carts and, you know, people herding goats around and blocking traffic. And so now with these urban sprawls and the real westernization of India, you miss out, you got to dig deep to find those places. So you have a taste of both those worlds, but now you're situated in the eco village. So you're sort of safe. <laughs> yeah. The eco village is kind of the bad, like you were describing how some Indian places in India have the kind of the worst of the Western and the worst of the Indian, yeah. but eco village is kind of the best of both. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. <laughs> so now, now back to the topic of addiction. Um, from your perspective, which is, um, you know, drawing from Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and Upanishads and Vedic texts, yogic teachings. How do you understand addiction? Is it something that is, is it a chemical thing? Is it, is it a, is it a problem of, is it a functional problem that certain people have and they're just unlucky that they were born with it? Is it a moral issue? It, you know, is it, is it just a weakness of moral strength? How do you understand it? addiction and the, let's say in like an addictive mentality yeah. or addictive personality. Yeah. You know, it is uh, both. Uh, let me start with a metaphor. Consider okay. a snowball. When a snowball is on top of a hill, it's basically, it's a small snow pebble. Mm -hmm. That time so you can just flick it with your uh, toe and it'll crack apart. Mm. But as the snowball keeps coming down the hill, it starts gaining mass and momentum. Mm -hmm. And as it starts coming down, 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 the same person who could have flipped it with their toe might now be completely knocked down by it. So what? So similarly, we could say all of us have cravings within us. So for some of us, those cravings are at the snow pebble level. So we could say the snow pebble at the top it becomes a snowball along the way. By the time it comes down, it's a snow boulder. Hmm. It's, so for some of us, the craving is at a snow pebble level. And we can easily resist it. So say somebody who has say, never taken alcohol or has never taken drugs, and they see somebody succumbing to say, drugs use again and again, say, I'll not do it, and they relapse, and they say no, and they relapse. Why can't you just give it up? Mm -hmm. So what happens for them? It's a snow pebble. So they can they easily say no to it. Mm. But for somebody who has got hooked to it, that's in their consciousness, that snow pebble has rolled down, rolled down, rolled down. It has come to the level of being a snow boulder. So for them, it's not just a matter of having less willpower. You know, no matter how much willpower a person has, a snow boulder will still overpower them. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, Every addiction starts as a starts as a wrong choice. But as we start, as if we keep choosing it, then more and more that choice starts controlling us. So it's uh, so we could say that what happens is the scope. I talked earlier about how we always have free will. Mm. So I would like to differentiate between two words: free will and freedom. 
okay so if a person is in a jail in a jail also a, they have free will but they don't have freedom in a jail their physical movement is restricted that technological access may be restricted so free will is something which is there even in a jail but the the area over which that free will can be exercised that becomes lesser and lesser if a person keeps doing wrong wrongs and then in a jail mm -hmm. it's curtailed so even in a jail if a person keeps uh, say being abusive offensive then they might be put in solitary confinement Still so where their their freedom becomes further reduced so i would say same way with respect to addiction even an addict has free will but their freedom is significantly curtailed that's because the snow the snow pebble has become such a snowball that when it comes they just can't overpower it so now is it chemical yes definitely it is chemical but it is not just chemical by chemical what do we mean that the more scientists have studied the brain then they found that the brain is made up of uh, what is called as brain cells or neurons so there are, there are the brain cells when they connect with each other let's say the synapse the brain cells fire and the 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 popular saying in neuroscience is that the the brain cells that fire together wire together Mm -hmm. that means if i act in a particular way then the brain cells that enable me to act in that way they get connected and next time when i have to act it becomes easier and easier so yes somebody who is uh, who is addicted their brain cells are formed in a particular way have become formed in a particular way and that action becomes uh, habitual for them it becomes even without their thinking it happens mm. conditioned so it is but the fortunate thing is that the brain is actually not uh, it is not uh, frozen it is changeable so the brain has been wired in a particular way but it can be rewired so so we could say addiction starts as a wrong choice mm -hmm. as a, a thoughtless choice we could say but then it becomes almost impossible to give up that choice so eventually it becomes not a it becomes not a it becomes like a disease so mm. disease means we don't blame a person why have you why have you got this disease so and so when a person is facing the snow boulder at that time just telling them you know why don't you have, have more will power that is not very helpful mm. so at that time it's a disease and it needs to be supported appropriately and then gradually will power will always be required even when somebody has a disease they need will power to take the treatment but when a disease is there will power alone is not enough to cure the disease so if somebody has got is coughing very severely and they are in a class and their their cough is disturbing the class you tell them just use your will power and suppress your cough <laughs> well you can't do that for very long so when it becomes a disease that's the time when will power has to be complemented with a appropriate process so that's how gradually can come out of our addictive cravings hmm. fascinating yeah um that's why these the first bad choice is problematic that first bad choice and for those who have never done drugs or never done alcohol or have never like crossed that thr threshold into a dharma they're they're better off but if we have and i think a lot of us here in the west have we just sort of like we experiment you know and uh there's that famous idea of first class behavior first class behavior means you hear something for the first time do not put your hand on the stove and and you listen and you don't burn your hand but and second class intelligence is where someone says do not put your hand on the stove but they say well i want to test it out and we touch the stove we burn our hand and third class intelligence is don't put your hand on the stove and we repeatedly touch the stove you're dealing with a bunch of people who have repeatedly burned their hand doing the same thing again and again and so um it's very difficult we're creating we, we're living with that giant snowball a lot of us and a, a lot of people are just really new to the show 
and they're dealing with these things. Meat eating, we're attached to meat eating. We grew up on it. It, it's, it seems like, well, what's the big deal? It's the big deal because it's, it's, it, it's integrated into every facet of our life. It's a very big deal for a lot of us or um, alcohol or uh, drugs or marijuana and things like that. Um, uh, anyway, um, I'm just, yeah. I'm just ram I'm just rambling <laughs> here. Cause Luba. that's okay. I, okay. I have a, I have a just further one question. Point, if I may add, yes, you know, please, please. Yeah. Example. So you see, you know, what I talked about neuroscience, that is something which uh, we can find in, even in the books of material self-help teachers or material, uh, de addiction yeah. counselors. Now the significant thing that spirituality as spiritual wisdom adds is if we have only a materialistic worldview, then we are our brain. Mm. So basically mm -hmm. I am programmed in a particular way. And in a sense, it's, there is no I beyond the brain. Yes. Okay. So what spirituality tells us is if the materialistic worldview implies that ultimately we don't have free will. If I'm product of my brain program, if I'm nothing, my consciousness, is nothing more than my brain, then that is what who, that is who I am. So it implies that we are basically programmed machines, mm -hmm. but that's what materialistic worldview implies. Whereas mm -hmm. spiritual worldview tells us is we are not programmed machines. We are possessors of those machines and we are different from our that machine. So we are possessors of programmable machines. Mm -hmm. and it's all these urges, they are coming within me. So another example, if I can use for this is, say if I'm driving a car and say there's somebody sitting next to me, maybe it's a small child and the child is super excited. Hey, look at that mall, look at that toy, look at that garden, look at that park, look at that. Now, if I keep looking everywhere, I won't go anywhere. I'll probably meet with an accident. Hmm. But the key is, that the wheels are in my hands. The wheels are not in the hand of the child. Okay. Mm. The mm. child may be very noisy, maybe disruptive, but the child does, is not in control of the car. So, so what spirituality tells us is that, yes, there is this noisy child in our car. That noisy child is our, you could say our brain with its particular neuronal patterns mm -hmm. or our mind with its particular conditionings. It is there. And it is real, but you could say that the, the mind can only propose, it can't impose. Right. The child can say, look at that, watch at this, look at that. But it is for me, it's, it may be very difficult if the child is calling out very loudly. I may be inclined to look at that, but I am in, I am in the driver's seat. Hmm. So this is what spiritual wisdom gives us this understanding that we are different from our brain, we are different from our mind. Okay. So our past actions have affected our brain, they have affected our mind, but they haven't affected us at our core. Mm. The soul is always pure. The soul is always a part of God. And, in the, and the soul never is beyond all the conditionings of the mind and the conditions of the body. Mm. That's why the more we learn to uh, connect with spiritual practices, more we practice spirituality, more we practice bhakti, the more we start realizing our spirituality. So yes, I'll conclude this another metaphor over there. Right? So if I'm in an yeah. ocean and the waves come in that ocean, no matter how much willpower I have, I will be swept away by the waves. But if I am lifted above that ocean, say by a helicopter with a rope, or if I get an anchor, which I can hold on to, then the waves will come, but they won't, they won't, they won't sweep me away. So if we do not have a spiritual worldview, then it's like we are caught in the ocean and we get swept away, no matter how much we try. But the more we understand spirituality, the more we get an anchor to hold on to. So just spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding, serious spiritual practices, they are like the anchor. The more we hold on to our spiritual practices, 
still we are in the ocean and the waves will hit us mm. but the waves won't sweep us away if you just hold on to the anchor the waves won't sweep us away and as we grow spiritually it's not just we hold on to the anchor but actually we start rising above the water like we get a rope and start rising and then we get affected less and less mm. so spiritual wisdom and spiritual practices can be extremely empowering in over overcoming whatever past uh, cond- habits or addictions we might be having okay now this is i have a big question now and um you're you're mentioning how we have certain programming in the brain and we have certain conditioning in the mind and that can lead to different emotional states and sometimes those emotional states can seem overwhelming mm-hmm. i would like you to for you to for us to apply your very analytical um thinking to the idea of how emotions let's see let let me put it this way when you look at bhakti practitioners yogis bhakti yogis um and their it's how emotions maybe how negative how how one may be what are the problems or what are the issues the emotional issues that you see playing out and and um becoming problematic in people's practice of bhakti yoga does that make sense yeah how do our emotions prevent us from because we all struggle with different things in our practice and sometimes there are emotional issues that are disconnecting us in some way or slowing us down are there certain patterns that you see um in in bhakti practitioners yes so let's say that you no know, unrealistic expectations that is i think the biggest uh, challenge on the spiritual path and i'll explain this with another metaphor you know you could talk about say there is say there's digital logic and there is analog logic digital is either one or zero and analog is like a gradual progression so quite often if we come to spirituality and especially if we come to a serious spiritual path where there is there is a serious commitment and there is a genuine aspiration to grow then quite often we acquire like a digital conception of spirituality uh, that if i am doing this if i am able to do this then i am spiritual and if i fail to do this then i am i am fallen i am materialistic i am lost so when we have this one zero understanding then that can lead to a lot of uh, inner turmoil guilt guilt mm. see i am so i come in front and I, would, uh, i go to a temple and i look at the deities i go to a holy place and i sup- i am supposed to feel spiritual but i don't feel anything what's wrong with me or you know i've been practicing spirituality i should have been gi- i should have been able to give up these temptations but still i feel tempted hmm. what's wrong with me so what happens if i if i start if i fail to feel devotional emotions or if i feel any non anti devotional emotions sensual emotions then i start thinking that i am not at one i am at zero and then that sense of failure can affect us very badly so in the bhagavad gita in the 12th chapter krishna talks about krishna actually categorically rejects this digital idea of spirituality hmm. and in the 12th chapter from verses 8 to 12 he gives multiple levels now say try to naturally fix your mind on me and then you will live in me right now if you can't do that this is you try to fix your mind on me so if you can't do that then do you work for me you do some seva you do some service for me if you can't do that then you just do something for some good cause right and gradually by this develop some level of selflessness so krishna offers multiple levels at which one can grow spiritually so i find that you know i, I you know, i'm preparing a series of talks based on you know i i'm titling that talk as things i wish i had known 20 years ago <laughs> okay about bhakti yoga 
right. you know, about Viola understanding of, I've been practicing for 25 years. So about Bhakti or 10, 20 years ago. So we all are burdened by some of our conceptions. Just like you talked earlier about, we bring certain conceptions or certain wounds from our past, but we also have our conceptions about Bhakti and they can also burden us. So this, mm. I find this one zero understanding of spirituality. If I fail to do this, then I am worthless. Or if I do this, then I am such, I, I am useless. So that has to be avoided. So there, there is, you know, if we have often say we should love Krishna, we should love God, mm -hmm. but how can we love Krishna if we don't love his parts? And the part of Krishna for which we have the most responsibility is this part. So if I don't love myself, how can I love Krishna? Because I am, I, if I'm hating one part of Krishna, where is my love for Krishna? Hmm. So when I'm talking about love for Krishna, it's, it's not in the narcissistic sense that I am great, but it's in just in a sense that I understand that I am also part of Krishna and Krishna will never reject us. No matter how many mistakes we have committed, no matter how many mistakes we may commit in the future, Krishna is still there in our hearts. He never leaves us and goes away. In fact, we never have the power to do anything that will make Krishna stop loving us. So Krishna will never stop loving us. So why should we Yes, we all have difficult, we all have defects, we all make mistakes. But if we truly love Krishna, then we need to love this part of Krishna also. So self-accept, we often talk about self-realization, but self-realization cannot begin without self-acceptance. This hmm. is where I am and I accept myself. So, you know, we sometimes we commit some mistakes and it requires courage to accept our mistakes, to accept our weaknesses. But another part of courage, which we don't talk about is, it requires courage to also accept ourselves with our weaknesses. Hmm. To accepting our weaknesses to someone else, yes, I made this mistake, that requires courage. But accepting ourselves with our weaknesses also requires courage. And that is that aspect of bhakti, where to love Krishna, we need to accept ourselves as we are. And we need to love ourselves, not in a narcissistic sense, but in a devotional sense. Hmm. I feel that can lead to a lot of expulsion of unhealthy emotions on the path of Bhakti Yoga. Fascinating. You kind of ended up where Raghunath kind of began with this, dealing with the idea of self-loathing. Um, and, and so you're, when, you know, and I brought up, you know, like emotionally, you know, what slows people down on their Bhakti path. And this is right where you went. So I'm... I'm assuming that you feel this is a major issue. Oh, yes, very much. Because to some extent, you know, I, I, I have studied psychology and many of my friends are in are study are either psychologists or they're psychiatrists. So they told me something very striking. One of my friends told me that in today's world, loneliness is a big problem in mm -hmm. general. Yeah. And as our city, as we start society becomes more urbanized, you know, it's understandable. What he told is that quite often in religious groups with high moral standards, loneliness is more than what is in the secular society also. Mm. Interesting. Because what happens is that if we are expected to follow high moral standards and if I'm struggling to do that, then I can't tell anyone because what will others think of me? Sure. Mm -hmm. We've created a culture where we have to live maybe two, two different lives. It, it creates duplicity, actually. I, and that's one reason I'm really grateful for the, maybe for the first time that there's been this marriage that we have going on our show between the Bhakti Path and the recovery group. We have a 12-step Bhakti recovery group where people can really just be vulnerable because sometimes that's a big hard thing for people to do is share their dark side with anybody. If you're not part of that, you can, uh, you can, ask how to how to be a part of that 12-step recovery group it's a really great thing and i'm grateful for all the people leading it um but yeah this is i think this is the next step in our bhakti for us mm. dented cans it, it's it seems like you know chaitanya charns identifying that is such a key thing 
mm. that uh, it's it's something that any bhakti community, any spiritual community, has to address somehow. Sure, the public has to have some appearance. strategy how to how to deal with it. Yeah, the 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 pub the, the, the ideal and then what's real. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, there's a struggle with the ideal. We heard the ideal. We heard the pure devotee thing thrown around so much. Now what's real? What's real with my situation, with my, um, with my background, with my history, with my, uh, my, my present issues, with my family, with my um, relationships? What's real for me? And how do I apply that? And how do I make progress and stop like being obsessed with perfection? Um, mm -hmm. Um, by the way, on a side note, uh, someone asked this question, Chaitanya Charan, do you have a lecture explaining this in Hindi? My nephew is having yeah, some addiction problems. Maybe... Uh, we, really, we really don't appreciate you yeah. looking at the message board. Kastuba, <laughs> tell him. Tell him. He can look at the message board and still be 100% <laughs> present. That's the difference. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only one banned from the message board. <laughs> That's because you live entirely there. Uh, and it's too it's, obvious when you're doing, having he fun. did it we didn't even notice you do it it's like it's so obvious it's like <laughs> they're having fun you know what i do i drag the message board right under my camera you never know anymore <laughs> no i know i know i always know i, I resist drone? i resist you bringing a drone in my room <laughs> so anyway did you read that message uh, how can yeah, people you know find i like to search i have a talk i will maybe send it to kostuba prabhu and you can share it afterward sure sure Okay, great. Or they'll look on your, do you speak in English on your YouTube channel or Hindi? I, I've seen some in English, obviously, but yeah, you have yeah. Hindi. Yeah, yeah, it's mostly English. But if you just search for on my channel for Hindi, whatever talks are in Hindi, you will find that uh, okay. all the talks in Hindi will also come. So they have the label Hindi over there. Fantastic. So Chaitanya Charm, you know, uh, you've seen our chat board, it's blowing up, people want you back. And um, I'm, I'm hoping, I am no Raghunath's hoping maybe before we before we spoke to you this morning, we're thinking, you know, maybe Chaitanya Charan is a person that we could bring on, like, I don't know, every couple months or something like that. Could you check in? Would you would you uh, be part of our community here? Really, my honor to be a part of your penny service. I I think you have so much. You know, I feel like um, you're this huge iceberg of of you know, understanding and knowledge and an ability to explain that knowledge. And we just, you know, we didn't even, you know, there's the tip of the iceberg. We're at the very tip, tip, tip of the iceberg. You know, we just, just got just a, a little bit, but there's so much that you have to share on so much, so many relevant topics for us. We want the entire iceberg, please. We want the whole iceberg. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll be inviting you back. I want to mention that um, very soon you're going to be doing um, a program with the Bhakti Center. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so I, I'm my one of my main services is writing. Yeah. So one aspect of writing is journaling. So I developed a course on the yoga of writing, mm. which yoga is writing. more for writing can be for sharing with the world, but writing can also be for connecting with ourselves. Mm. So writing as yoga for self understanding, self awareness. So it's a three session course from the Bhakti Center. It is uh, next month, so I think I shared the link with you. Okay. So, but people can be, go to bhaktisenter.org and there look for. I'll be broadly talking about. So I'll be broadly talking about how, by using words, we can not only express our thoughts, but we can also discover our thoughts. We can use words as hmm. torchlights to understand our inner world. So I'll be talking about the spiritual wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedic texts combined with the, the strategies of journaling. Now, journaling is itself quite well developed in uh, as a means of therapy mm. in the even for de addiction journaling therapy is uh, quite often talked about. But using journaling therapy, journaling as a therapy and integrating it with the spiritual wisdom of the Gita. I haven't seen that done till now. So I'll be, I try to do that. And you're most welcome if you like to join. So go to bhaktisenter.org and then look for the, the yoga of writing. It, it's probably on their homepage and on their culture page. You can find it in both these places, I would assume. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Prabhu. 
That was I don't awesome. know if you know that, but we, we dance now. We have a thing. Thank, now thank we you, Now we dance. <laughs> thank you, Chaitani Charam Prabhu, and we're looking forward to having you back. You are an ocean of devotion and an ocean of great transcendental wisdom. I want to thank everybody for joining us on Facebook today. And anyone, if you there was something that stuck out, some little nugget of wisdom, write it down on your phone, take a snapshot of it, and post it and, po and tag us, Wisdom of the Sages, um, and, or Raghunath Yogi, and then we'll repost it. Um, because it's in sending out these little nuggets of wisdom that could really change somebody's day, someone's week, or someone's life. Uh, my takeaway is we are not, wait, we are, wait a second, we are, <laughs> wait, wait a second. We're, we're products. What? What was we it? Are. We're products of the past. Yeah, the we're, products we're products of the, of the past, but we're not prisoners of the past. That's going to be my little tattoo. nugget of wisdom takeaway. Maybe a neck tattoo, perhaps. Forehead. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Make sure you go to Apple Podcasts and you write us a, a, a review and you tell us your story, how you got here. We love to read them. We love to get to know you. And thanks so much for everybody. Uh, uh, joining us on a regular basis, really inspired. Chaitanya Sharan, some of these people are listening to Bhagavatam every day. It's quite impressive. And you were here, you actually were here with us last year, remember? Before yes, we were, exactly. before we were Wisdom of the Sages, you came on. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Thank you for this opportunity and the podcast which you are doing is phenomenal. I'm grateful to be having the opportunity to be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. We wish you were with you at the Govardhan Echo Village. Now, don't tune off. We need you to put your hands in the air like this, if you don't mind. And then I want you to dance. That oh, really? Okay. That's the only way that you can dance.